give my regards to 8th Street. But to tell it all, just as it happened, because, of course, a great deal had happened, not only to me and to everybody else I knew, but to everything else. Once more, Paris is not as it was. Gertrude Stein. Not long ago, I saw the Elgin marbles. I didn't faint, as they say Shelley did, but I certainly had to sit down. Nothing knocks us out like this anonymity, this beauty without a biography. The artist himself loves the idea. What artist hasn't longed to get away from the human effort he puts into his work? What artist doesn't have the illusion that the Greeks did their work without human effort? Even the timelessness of Giacometti seems to us more a reference to a buried civilization than to a buried colleague. Nietzsche with his Greeks, John Cage with his Zen, always this need for an idealized, depersonalized art. Saint-Beuve, for example, was so carried away by a passion for classicism that he never said a good word about Balzac, Stendhal, Baudelaire, or Flaubert. The critic's ideal has always been the process without the artist. If it wasn't classicism, it was expressionism or cubism. Whatever it is, the artist gets in his way. More and more today, there is this feeling of, by all means, let's have art, but no names, please. But the 50s in New York have to do with names, names, names. That's why they're worth writing about. When I met John Cage in 1950, I was 24 years old. He was living then on the top floor of an old building on the East River Drive and Grand Street. Two large rooms with a sweeping expanse of the river encircling three sides of the apartment. Spectacular and hardly a piece of furniture in it. Richard Lippold had a studio next door. Sonia Sekula, an unusually gifted painter, she reminded me of Elizabeth Bergner, lived on the floor below. Soon after John and I met, an apartment became vacant on the second floor, and I too moved into Bose's mansion, as it was called in honor of our landlord. It was great fun, a sort of pre-hippie community, but instead of drugs, we had art. There was sometimes more activity in the hallways than our studios, what with John running into my place with a new idea for a piece, or me rushing into his. Visitors, too, were shifted from floor to floor. I met Henry Cowell in this way. Cowell came to visit John, and John brought him down to meet me. He sat down at my piano, played a few of his pieces, and talked for hours. What a delightful and kind man he was. One day, there was a knock at my door. It was John. I'm going over to see a young painter called Robert Rauschenberg. He's marvelous, and his work is marvelous. You must meet him. Five minutes later, we were both in John's Model A Ford on the way to Rauschenberg's studio on Fulton Street. Rauschenberg was working on a series of black paintings. There was one big canvas I couldn't stop looking at. Why don't you buy it, Rauschenberg said. What do you want for it? Whatever you've got in your pocket. I had $16 and some change, which he gleefully accepted. We immediately put the painting on top of the Model A, went back to Bose's mansion, and hung it on the wall. That was how I acquired my first painting. One day, it was arranged that John, Lippold, and I were to be jointly interviewed for a magazine article. I suggested that we get together with the editor at my place for lunch and said I would make cheese blintzes. John thought it was a wonderful idea and said he would bring the salad. I told him salad was unnecessary. Lippold then offered to make soup. I finally persuaded him that soup was also unnecessary. Neither of them understood my lunch plans, but finally gave in. As a concession to John, I served the blintzes in his Japanese wooden bowls. Everybody enjoyed them, though I don't think Lippold was ever convinced about the soup. After the lunch, the three of us were photographed together in a hearse belonging to Lippold. John and I occasionally took a lift uptown in this hearse, which Lippold used to transport his sculptures. Cars on the East River Drive always kept at a respectful distance. Once I rode in the back part and amused myself by smiling out the window at passing motorists. John and I spent a lot of time playing cards. 
One afternoon, my friend Daniel Stern came over with a pair of dice. John came down immediately, and we told him how the game was played. John made his first throw, standing up, and just dropping the dice to the floor. We explained the procedure was to bend your knees as far down as possible, then throw the dice. This he did. He also started to shake them. We hadn't told him to do that, and before letting them go, he cried out, to our amazement, Baby needs a new pair of shoes. It was Daniel Stern who also introduced us to the world of science fiction writers. He knew the editor of a science fiction magazine called Galaxy and took us over to meet him one evening. This editor, because of a phobia about going outdoors, ran the magazine from his apartment. A huge telescope in the middle of the living room brought him closer to whatever was happening in the Stuyvesant Town Street below, and a poker game went on almost every night. For about two years, John and I went to this house every week. There were always several card games going. The editor's wife gave the players change from a bus driver's change maker, which she wore strapped around her waist and worked with lightning speed. There was a lot of talk about science fiction, also about Dianetics, a currently popular technique that was said to bring back memories of the womb. As I recall, John and I, with our crazy ideas about music, fitted in very well. One could, in those days, sit around for hours talking wild ideas that sounded very like the theorizing you find in Russian novels. John, of course, was involved with Zen, but in spite of the terseness of Zen, it seemed to fill up the evenings just as well. What was surprising was that John actually invented unprecedented ways to write a music that contained these Zen ideas. One would think I would have gotten more involved with the ideas since I was so deeply interested in the music they produced. It didn't work that way. The more interested I got in Cage's music, the more detached I became from his ideas. I think this happened to Cage, too. As his music developed through the years, he talked less and less about Zen. At most, he would give it a sort of warm pat on the shoulder, like some old friend he was leaving in a comfortable hotel bar in Tokyo while he himself began his trek across the Gobi Desert. John, who lived on practically no money, gave marvelously sumptuous parties. Once I was introduced to a man who looked like a Viennese matinee idol, it was Max Ernst. I had recently read in some book about the bizarre surrealist behavior of Ernst. I watched him uneasily all night, waiting for something to happen, but his behavior remained impeccable. Another of these parties introduced my music to many of John's friends. The people who came, painters, writers, sculptors, were all new to me. On another evening, David Tudor played some now-forgotten piano pieces of mine for Virgil Thompson and George Antheil. This was my first introduction to the musical world. Until then, I had known only a few composers my own age. The faces of these people, the faces of gifted people, Max Ernst, Philip Guston, David Hare, Virgil Thompson, de Kooning, marvelous faces, unforgettable faces, Two of John's most influential lectures were first given at the Artists' Club, located then on 8th Street. The first lecture was called Nothing, the second Something, or perhaps it was the other way around. Boulez, on his first visit to America, also spoke at the club. He was totally unknown here, and it was John who arranged this talk. He also took Boulez around to many of the studios. John was so proud of the New York painters.